Welcome to our video on ecology. We're going to take a look at different relationships that occur, the food webs, food chains, transfer of energy, nutrients, biodiversity, and the human impact. Starting, we have to know the levels of hierarchy, levels of organization in ecology. First, the most simplest is an individual. That's just one organism of one particular species. We put a whole bunch of those organisms of that species together, you get our next step population. Many organisms of the same species, just like the human population. It only refers to humans. Next picture, it looks like we have the little gray fish, but we have the orange fish, jellyfish, crabs, grass. We have all the living things in a particular area. That's called the community. Another way to think about it, a community is all the biotic living things in an area. Next step, ecosystem. It looks like the same thing as community, but we added rocks, we added water. Those things are not living. So it looks like ecosystem is all the living and non-living things in an area. Different ecosystems have different biotic factors. Like you find cactuses or cacti in deserts. You don't find them in the tundra. You find palm trees in tropical regions. You don't find them in the deciduous forests of Canada. And also different ecosystems have different abiotic factors. Temperature, sunlight, moisture. Tropical rainforests have a lot more moisture than a desert. Same thing with temperatures. Temperatures in a desert are much more um, extreme than, say, the tundra in Canada. And finally, or not finally, but Biome. Biome, it's all the deserts put together. So you have a bunch of deserts, deserts all around the world, but if you put them all together, you get the desert biome. So it's all similar ecosystems together. Same thing with tundra. You have tundras all around the world. You put all similar tundra together. That makes the tundra biome. And finally, biosphere. The word bio means living. Sphere is area. So biosphere literally means anywhere you find living things, just like hydrosphere is wherever you find water, geosphere is wherever you find rock, biosphere is wherever you find living things. Focusing on these two words, biotic versus abiotic, bio we said was living, and when you put an A in front of something, it refers to or means not or without. So abiotic means not living. So biotic are living things, abiotic not living. Get me to think of a few examples of, well, what are some living and non-living things? Looking at the Amazon jungle, oxygen clearly is not living, it's abiotic. Jaguars, bullet ants, mushrooms, all biotic. Water and underground burrows, abiotic, not living. Dissolved oxygen in the Great Barrier Reef, yes, there's dissolved oxygen in water, non-living. Great white shark, living, dissolved CO2, acidity level, the pH, both not living. Sea anemone, the thing in the upper right with the tentacles, biotic, and sunlight, abiotic. Looking a little deeper at organisms in their ecosystems, to the right there's a big data box, it tells all about alligators. Can you use that data box to figure out what the definition of habitat and the definition of niche are? Right here shows the alligator's habitat. It's describing where the alligator lives. So habitat is where an organism lives. Niche, this whole thing describes an alligator's niche. A niche is the role an organism has in its environment. That includes everything, how they live, what they eat, how they reproduce, any relationships they have, and more. A niche includes an organism's habitat. Habitat is part of their role. There are a lot of relationships that go on in nature, and there's some good, some bad, and some deadly ones. Nonetheless, all organisms, two or more, either directly or indirectly depend on each other. This is called interdependence. When two organisms directly depend on each other for each other's survival, 
those specific relationships are called symbiotic relationships. And there are three types of them. First, on the left, is a mutualistic relationship. Like when someone says the feeling's mutual, that means you have the same feeling. In this relationship, both organisms will benefit each other. The bumblebee gets sugar or nectar from the flower, and the flower puts pollen on the bee. So when the bee goes to another flower, the pollen falls off, which is plant sperm, and it fertilizes the other plant. So bees help flowers reproduce, and bees get sugar in the meantime. They both benefit. Commensalism or commensalistic relationships. You see a shark with these little fish called remora that swim behind it for the most part. When the shark eats, all the scraps of food go behind it. These little fish get easy food. They probably also get protection because I wouldn't want to go up to a shark. The shark, however, it's not affected at all. It's not hurt. It doesn't benefit. It's unaffected. So commensalism is when one organism doesn't benefits and the other neither benefits nor is harmed. The last one, probably the most important, I've seen this one the most on a living environment regions, parasitism, parasitic relationships. Here you see these little ticks. These are lone star ticks. These are very, very common and they can give you Lyme disease they can give you a red meat allergy, meaning you can't eat red meat anymore, or they can give you both. They are, ticks are a very big problem. They're popping up all over nowadays and in great numbers. We're trying to use quails, the natural predators of quick ticks, to kill the tick population. They suck the blood, they get huge and plump, and they take all the nutrients out of our blood. So they benefit, we don't. We can get diseases that could last our lifetime. Down here you see a, this is a tapeworm head. It uses these great big spikes to plunge itself into your intestinal wall. And as the nutrients come by your intestines, it takes the nutrients it wants. It wants you to stay alive. So does the tick, because as long as you're alive, it can get its nutrients. So a parasitic relationship is where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. The harmed organism is referred to as a host. Some relationships are deadly though. We have the predator versus prey relationship. Predators are organisms that consume other ones. Prey are the organisms that get consumed, that get hunted. Predators must eat many prey during their life to get enough nutrients to survive. Sharks are going to eat many seals. Lions will eat many, looks like a gazelle. So with that in mind, that predators must eat many prey, one predator might have to eat 20 prey during its life or more. What does there have to be more of, prey or predators? Thinking of that, in the graph or the data table to the left, which one's the predator and which one's the prey, the moose or the wolves? Which one's prey, which one's predator? Moose are the prey, wolves are the predator. Wolves eat multiple moose throughout their lives, so there must be multiple moose, or many more moose than wolves. There must be more prey than predator. Same thing on the left. Which one's the predator? Population B is the predator, and population A is the prey. There's more prey and less predator. Rule of thumb, there's always more prey and less predator in a stable ecosystem. If there are more predators than prey, not a good thing. The predators are going to eat all their food, the prey, and then the predators will wind up starving. Looking at this data table, or this graph, looks like there's an anomaly here. The prey population, the moose, is growing to its largest numbers. I mean, it's never hit, what is it, like 18, 1900? Why is the predator population, the wolves, not increasing? Why is it staying low? There must be some external factor keeping it low. This could be overhunting due to humans. It could be a pathogen that's specific to wolves. Something's keeping the wolves and just the wolves low.
autotrophs versus heterotrophs. Autotrophs and heterotrophs are found in every ecosystem. Autotrophs, they're called producers. Why? Because they make their own food. They produce it by photosynthesis. These are things like trees, bushes, grasses, algae, all, the, all those. Heterotrophs, they're also called consumers. They consume or eat food because they can't make it on their own. We are heterotrophs. Also dogs, hawks, lions, animals. In the animal kingdom, the fungi kingdom, all heterotrophs. Down below, we're going to see there's many types. Herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, scavengers, decomposers. Many types of consumers. Can you determine the type of heterotroph using the description in the data table below? Humans, we eat everything. We're omnivores, all eaters. We eat plants and animals. Cows, horses, bunnies, they love eating grass. Herbivores eat plants only. Mushrooms, a type of fungus. Decomposer. Eats dead organisms and breaks them down into inorganic nutrients. And those nutrients are then used by plants. These organisms recycle nutrients. Decomposers. Next one, eats dead organisms and uses the nutrients it gets. Doesn't recycle them. They have really strong stomach acid to prevent getting diseases. These are scavengers. Bears eat berries fish, and other animals. Omnivore. Lions, hyenas, they both fight over a freshly killed gazelle or zebra so they can eat the most meat off the animal. Carnivore. Meat eating only. Let's look and see how all these relationships fit together. And the best way to look at all the relationships is not looking at a food chain, which is simply just one pathway, the best way to look at all the interactions in an ecosystem is a food web. It's all the food chains in an ecosystem together. It shows all the interactions between all the organisms in an ecosystem. It shows also interdependency. It shows that organisms in some way, shape, or form, directly or indirectly, they do rely on each other. And let's take a look at those relationships. This little guy down here, the grass, these are the producers. Above it, grasshopper eats the grass. They're an herbivore. Based on this information, the frog looks like it only eats the grasshopper. So it eats meat. It's a carnivore. A secondary consumer. It's the second thing that consumes. The snake eats the frog carnivore, and that will be a tertiary consumer. And finally, the top dog, the hawk, that is the top or apex predator, it's carnivore. All these organisms, the grass, grasshoppers, frog, snake, and hawk, when they die, they all get consumed by this thing, decomposers. So the arrows are all showing the direction of the nutrients and the energy. It shows the arrows will point to the organism that eats. For example, grass and grasshopper. The arrow points to the grasshopper because the grasshopper eats the grass. And again, the arrows show the direction of the nutrients and energy in an ecosystem. Producers they never have arrows pointing at them. They always have arrows pointing away. That's very important to know, because if you had a diagram with just letters and no descriptions, no pictures, you would have to figure out, well, how do I know which one's a producer? If there's no arrows pointing to it, it is a producer. Vice versa, at the top, no arrows point away from the top predator except for the decomposer, because decomposers eat everything when they die. So the top predator, all arrows point to it, or sorry, arrows point to top predators. There's no arrows pointing away except towards the decomposer. 
and decomposers, that's an easy one, all arrows from every organism point to decomposers because they eat everything when they die. Examples of decomposers are bacteria and fungi, things like mushrooms and mold. You have to know two examples of decomposers. Using your knowledge, pause this video and see if you can identify what each of those letters are. Letter A looks like it has an arrow from B. This only eats B. B has arrows all pointing away from it. B must be a producer and A therefore must be an herbivore because it only eats the producer, which is B. How do we know B is a producer? There's no arrows pointing to it. It makes food, it gets eaten. Letter C. It looks like it eats plants, it eats letter B, but it also eats letter F. Letter F is not a producer because it has an arrow going to it, so it must be an animal. So C eats animals and plants. C is an omnivore. Letter D. Arrows from every organism are pointing to D. That's easy. Everything gets consumed by D when they die. This is a decomposer. Letter E. Let's see. It eats F, an herbivore, C, an herbivore. The only arrow pointing away from it is to a decomposer. This definitely must be a top predator of some sort. This is a, looks like a carnivore. And letter F. It only eats B. It is an herbivore. It's also a prey to letter C and a prey to letter E. Looking at some practice questions. To the left, which statement regarding organisms in this food web are correct? Or is correct? Answer is three. There would be more insects than insect eating birds. Because remember, there's always more prey than predators. To the right, even though both hawks and owls have the two sources of food, explain why hawks would be less likely to survive if a disease wiped out mice. Well, hawks, they eat snakes and they eat mice. Owls, they eat frogs and they eat mice. So if we get rid of the mice, the owls will be hurting for food. Yeah, but the owls have the frogs. Okay. If we get rid of the mice, the snakes will have no food because that's all they eat. If the snakes and mice are gone, the hawks have no food. They're probably going to die out. The owls, though, they still have their frogs to eat. So hawks eat mice and snakes. If mice are gone, the snakes will also die off since they eat mice too. This will leave the hawk with no food source. All right. I'd pause the video if I were you, read the story and the question, obviously read the question before the story, and underline some key things. You have to fill out this food web, and I'm looking, looks like some important information here. Here, Lake Sturgeon, like bloaterfish, eat a variety of small organisms, including insect larvae, worms, and clams. So, lake sturgeon eat insect larvae, worms, and clams, they said, right? So, this must be clams. And it says the bloaterfish eat the same stuff. So, the bloaterfish also eat clams, insect larvae, and worms. That works. So, you can actually get that filled in. What do the insect larvae and worms and clams eat? Oh, look, the last sentence there says, these small organisms feed on algae. So, clams, perfect. 
Loaderfish eat the same thing as lace sturgeon. And clams, insect larvae, worms, they all eat algae. This was a region's question. Forgot when, but it was recent. Some more region's questions on food webs. Number one, the sea urchin. What's one role that they do? It looks like they are they eat giant kelp. They're consumers because they eat giant kelp. They're also prey because they're eaten by sea stars and sea otters. Describe one way a decrease in the number of sea urchins would affect the population of large fish. Sea urchins They're eaten by sea stars, okay, and sea otters. Sea otters eat sea stars, large crabs, and large fish. If you take away sea urchins, the sea stars will still have the snails. They're good. Sea otters will just eat more sea stars. They'll eat more large crabs, and they're going to eat more large fish. And that will cause the population of large fish to go down. You could also think of it in a different way. The large fish could also increase because the large fish, they eat large crabs. If you have less sea urchins eating the kelp, that means you're going to have more kelp available for the large crabs to eat you're going to have a larger, large crab population. Therefore, there's more crabs for the large fish to eat, and they will increase in population. So there are two ways or two things that could happen. And number three, explain why removing the sea stars could result in the loss of the entire kelp organ ecosystem. You get rid of sea stars. That means there's only one predator for sea urchins, sea otters. Their population will probably increase the sea otters. The snails, they're not going to have a predator anymore. That's their only predator. Uh-oh. Sea snails will lose their only predator. That means they're going to increase dramatically and eat all the kelp until the kelp is gone. So if the kelp is all gone, everything dies because there's no new introduction of energy to this ecosystem. So how does the energy enter the ecosystem? Energy comes from the sun. It's the ultimate source of all energy for every living thing. The energy you're using right now is ultimately from the sun. Things like producers and autotrophs, they capture the solar energy from the sun and they store it in carbon-hydrogen bonds in glucose. This is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is carried out by plants because they have chloroplasts. By capturing the solar energy and storing it in chemical bonds, glucose is made food. But glucose cannot be used by organelles as a direct energy source. Glucose has to be transformed into ATP by a process called cellular respiration carried out by the mitochondria. And this energy is going to be transferred from grass to grasshoppers and up the food chain. It's important to note that each of these levels, that the grass level is called a tropic level. All these levels are called tropic levels. But the grass tropic level, the producer one, that's so necessary for an ecosystem because without grasses, without producers, without autotrophs, no new energy could enter an ecosystem. So we said the energy and nutrients go from grass to grasshoppers. And grass producers, that's how energy first enters an ecosystem. So grasses are producers. They always contain the most stored energy. Always. So let's say you start with a thousand calories. Calories is a measure of how much energy is in food. 
eat a lot of calories, there's a lot of energy in that food. That's why you store it if you eat too many calories. Your body wants to save some. Let's say grass eats the grasshopper. How much of that energy gets passed on to the grasshopper? Only 10%. The other 90% is lost as heat. That means grasshoppers only get 100 calories out of those 1,000. There must therefore be more grass and less grasshoppers because grasshoppers eat lots of grass throughout their lifetime. And if there were equal amounts, grass would be gone very quickly. There's a lot more grass than grasshoppers. These rectangles, they represent the total number of organisms in that tropic level or the total amount of weight of those organisms in that tropic level. This is referred to as biomass. And producers, besides having the most stored energy, always have the most biomass in a stable ecosystem. Remember, in a stable ecosystem, there's always more prey than predators. In this case, between grass grasshoppers, there's always more producers than direct consumers. When the grasshopper is eaten by the frog, 10% of the energy is passed on. 90% is lost as heat. 10 calories are with the frog. And we're going to see this 10% energy getting passed on. And less and less energy as we move up this energy pyramid. Leaving the top predator, the hawk, with the least amount of available energy. Piggybacking on this idea... We're going to look at a, at a phenomena called biomagnification, also referred to as bioaccumulation. Let's first draw our tropic level boxes. They get smaller as you move up. On the bottom, the producer tropic level, let's say you start off with a one milligram of mercury in each patch of allergy. And let's say the lethal amount of mercury is 200 milligrams. If each sardine, one sardine, let's say, eats 10 patches of allergy, each sardine, when it eats one patch of allergy, it gets one milligram of mercury. If it eats another patch, it will get another milligram for a total of two. If it eats 10 patches, it's going to have a total of 10 milligrams of mercury in each sardine. The bluefin tuna, huge fish. This is the red tuna that you eat uh, when you get sushi. Let's say they eat 15 sardines. Each tuna is going to have 150 milligrams of, of mercury. And sharks, let's say they eat three tuna. They're going to have 450 milligrams of mercury. With that said, top predators will start to die or get very sick from the buildup, from the accumulation of these toxins through living tissue in food webs. That's why it's referred to as bioaccumulation, the accumulation of toxins through bio, living tissue. And the effects of that toxin, not bad at the low level, but when you accumulate enough, the effects of it are magnified. So biomagnification. The effects of toxins are magnified as they accumulate in living tissue. This could be, we could be the top predator, not the sharks. We eat tuna. That's why sometimes you might have heard, they say, if you're pregnant, don't eat tuna. Because the toxic metals in there could affect the very, very fragile development of a growing fetus and embryo. Let's focus a little in now on decomposers. That was one we really didn't focus on too much yet. Looking at this diagram, it shows what decomposers do. Mama elk, who died, is over here. She is made up of fats, proteins, DNA, glycogen. These are organic or inorganic? They're organic because they have carbon and hydrogen together. Every organism does this through the process of digestion. Fats are broken down into, or sorry, glycogen, a type of carbohydrates broken down into simple sugars, monosaccharides, things like glucose. DNA, deoxyribonucleic 
nucleic acid is broken down into nucleotides. Proteins broken into amino acids, definitely have to know that. Fats are broken down into fatty acids. And they contain a lot of energy fats because they have more CH bonds. Every organism does this, but decomposers, they take it a step further. They break the simple sugars, nucleotides, amino acids, fatty acids down into the atoms they are. Carbon, oxygen, phosphorus, um, you got ammonia, potassium. I made a little error there that should not be there because all these nutrients, they're all inorganic. Why? Because carbon and hydrogen are not bonded together. And all these nutrients, you can see, they get sucked up by the tree and they're used to make more tree. Like this branch right here might have came from or been made from all these inorganic nutrients. And the little baby is eating that branch, which was made using the nutrients that came from mom. And this little baby is going to grow up, might be a mom of its own. She might die. Same process is going to happen to her. Her organic body is going to be broken down into inorganic nutrients used by a plant, and the cycle continues. With this in mind, let's answer a few questions about decomposers. First off, two examples. Bacteria and fungi. Purpose of decomposers, recycle nutrients. Do they recycle energy too? No, they only recycle nutrients. Describe the decomposition process carried out by decomposers. Generally speaking, do they make inorganic material or do they make organic material? They convert organic material into inorganic nutrients. These inorganic nutrients, we said, are used by producers. That's why decomposers are so important. Producers rely on decomposers to add nutrients to the soil. Populations of decomposers of all heterotrophs and autotrophs. Uh, we can see a graph of what those population growths look like. And it looks like the populations, I don't know, about like year five or so, they start to level off and they hover around this dotted line. It looks like that's where the population is staying. This line is referred to as the carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is the maximum population size an ecosystem can sustain. It stays around the carrying capacity, the maximum population size, because of things that keep it there. There are a lot of pressures keeping the population from getting too large. These are called limiting factors. They limit the population. They include a host of things. Biotic, and abiotic, things like disease, temperature, shelter, predators, old age, water, food. All these things keep populations from increasing in numbers too much. So our question on our region's exam was on the bottom here, explain one likely reason for the population size changes as indicated by the graph between years 5 and 10. It looks like the population leveled off because it reached its carrying capacity, but it has slight fluctuations due to maybe differing birth rates or limiting factors like predators. Predators might be increasing and decreasing like we saw in the graphs earlier. So on the left, we have normal population growth. On the right, something a little different. Why does the human population grow exponentially past its carrying capacity? It looks like nothing's limiting our population. We got rid of our limiting factors, and it happened around, a big and a bit large way, around here, the early 20th century, late 19th century, a big increase. That was the Industrial Revolution time, medical advancements, huge changes in society, and that causes the population to go up. 
because we took out our limiting factors. This is not good though, because populations that grow past their limiting factors or their carrying capacity by getting rid of the, their limiting factors usually see a large die off. And we see that over here. It looks like this reindeer population spiked, probably because maybe they lost a predator, caused a huge spike in their population. And with that huge spike, they probably ate all their food. And if they eat all their food, it's going to cause a massive die off. But a few of them survived. We can kind of see that down at the bottom of the graph right there. Those few reindeer, that looks like 42 of them, might have had an adaptation for a different food source, maybe an adaptation for a smaller body size, meaning they needed less nutrients. Maybe they got an adaptation for a slower metabolism. But for some way, some reason, they did survive because they were well adapted to this changed environment. Not only do populations of animals grow, ecosystems, the plants, change as well. So ecological succession. Succession means what comes after. It's the changes in the types of plants of an ecosystem over time. And we could see early organisms like lichens, they might get the environment ready for things like grasses and perennials. Grasses and perennials will get the environment ready for larger organisms like shrubs and small trees like pine trees. These organisms will get the environment ready for larger, more complex organisms like oak and hickory trees. But we don't see some of the shrubs anymore. So yeah, we gain some new species, new plants, but we could also possibly lose some. So the environment changes over time. The plants in the environment change over time. It's ecological succession. Lichens are the first organisms in an area. They're called pioneer organisms. They literally digest rock and use the nutrients from the rock. And on the other end, this is called the climax community. Community, all the living things in an area. It is the most complex and specific ecosystem. It contains the most variety of species. Therefore, it has the most biodiversity. It's a lot of types of food, lots of areas for shelter. It's great for animals to move into. Therefore, since it has the most biodiversity, it is the most stable ecosystem. More biodiversity means more stability. How is the Regents going to ask us stuff on ecological succession? Here's an essay question in part C. Describe the first dot would be 57, next is 57, uh, 56, 57, 58. First dot, describe the specific kinds of changes that occur when ecological succession takes place. The types of plants in an ecosystem will change over time. Earlier plants get the environment ready for more complex plants. Second dot, 57, describe one way that a population of red foxes could be affected as a result of ecological succession. Well, if the plants are changing in the environment, is it possible that the plants could change and some of them could actually not be around anymore? And foxes could lose shelter, they could lose a food source, they could lose their prey species that maybe used a certain plant. So ecological succession changes the type of vegetation in an area, true, the foxes could no longer have what they need to survive, and they could move away or die. But on vice versa, ecological succession could make the area more favorable. There could be more sources of food, new prey come into the area, the foxes might have more to eat. Lastly, describe one way that a population of red foxes could be changed as a result of evolution. So this is a little curveball they're throwing an evolution question in the psychology one. So as time goes on, do you expect to see characteristics that hurt an organism's survival? No. 
the population of foxes will change over time, just like for every species, by having more, or actually better yet, the population will change by having a higher frequency of favorable traits. The fox population could contain more foxes with favorable traits after generations, such as increased eyesight, faster running speeds, better camouflage. As evolution only chooses favorable characteristics, ones that help survival or reproduction, called adaptations, evolution only chooses those to get passed on, not unfavorable ones that hurt survival or reproduction. Some more practice questions. Looking at the diagram to the upper right, food web and a graph, identify the population that has the greatest amount of stored energy. We learned that. That's allergy. It's always the producers. But they put allergy at the top of this thing. A little tricky. You just got to know that if the arrows point away and there's no arrows pointing to it, it's a producer. 53. What would most likely happen to the bass population if the pesticide killed the pickerel? Here are the bass. Here are the pickerel. Looks like the pickerel has an arrow going to it. So the pickerel eat the bass. That's the only thing that eats the bass. So if you get rid of the pickerel, there's nothing eating the bass. Bass eat amphipods. Bass eat crayfish. But there's going to be nothing to eat them. So the bass population will explode. They could possibly overpopulate. 54. Identify the role of bacteria in this food web. They didn't represent it totally well, um, but everything should have an arrow pointed to bacteria. That's a poorly drawn diagram. But they did just put this here. Dead organisms, plant, animal, anything, are eaten by bacteria. These bacteria, you know, are decomposers. And their importance of them is they recycle nutrients in an ecosystem that are going to be used by producers. And why did the bacterial population take a dive down? Why did it decrease? If there's less dead organisms for bacteria to eat, do you think that could reduce the population? Like if there was a lot less food for a particular species, the population is going to go down. We saw that in the predator-prey. Less prey, the predator population will go down. Less dead organisms, the bacteria population will go down. So bacteria eat dead organisms. If there are fewer dead organisms around, the bacterial population will have less to consume, causing their numbers to decrease. Thanks for watching and subscribe for more videos.